Okay. Um, so I'm Alec Glass. I practice over um, sort of with peak neurology and sleep medicine, which is sort of a newly formed group uh, over at Alaska Regional Hospital, and then we're expanding into uh, Providence relatively soon, which a lot of people know. Um, I'm tasked with talking about sleep and neurodegeneration. And in fact, I got into sleep. Um, basically, my interest stemmed when I was at Mayo Clinic doing my, my movement disorder fellowship. And so many of these patients had terrible sleep. Um, and it was a, sort of a fascinating thing. And I, I wrote a couple of case series there um, that just sort of triggered that interest. And then when I got to UCSF, I wanted to sort of keep pursuing that and work with Dave Clayman um, to sort of pursue that in, in, in that interest and be able to sort of bring those things together. So um, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the alpha synuclein related sleep disorders, which to me are sort of the most fascinating. I'm obviously highly biased because I spend a lot of my time seeing Parkinson's patients or other sort of atypical Parkinson's syndromes. Obviously, there are sleep disorders associated with other dementias, um, particularly as you see sort of later stages, right? You know that for those of you who take care of Alzheimer's patients and as they get institutionalized, you know, they get just terrible sleep wake rhythm problems and, and we really struggle um, to help them and their families. But um, when we classify neurodegenerative diseases, we really do it um, based on uh, um, sort of the underlying protein abnormality, right? So the alpha-synuclein-based disorders are Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease with dementia, Lewy body dementia, multiple systems atrophy, pure autonomic failure, which didn't make the list there. But, um, and those to me are sort of the, my favorite to see because they're, they're, they're just very interesting. And, and if you look at, you know, biopsy, they show alpha-synuclein accumulation um, in the neurons. Whereas the tau-based disorders, um, ALS, or uh, sorry, Alzheimer's disease is the most common, uh, FTD, progressive supranuclear palsy, cortical basal syndrome, which are stuff that you may or may not see in your whole life of practice in, in the general community, um, and or you may see and not know that you saw. Um, and so, and that seems to happen to me as well um, as you get through. So I'll start talking about Parkinson's, which is kind of my, my favorite. And as you can see, I just threw this slide up to let you know, you know, 30 plus percent of elderly adults complain of sleep problems of some variety or another. Um, diabetics, 40 something percent, almost 50 percent. And that's just sort of, um, w when they did this study, it was just to sort of look at sort of disability matched controls for Parkinson's patients. And the, the point of this slide is basically that patients with Parkinson's disease are way more likely to have sleep problems of some variety or another than disability matched controls. And those range from REM sleep behavior disorder, which is a fascinating issue and I'll show you in a minute. Um, insomnia, and this tends to not be sleep initiation insomnia as um, we so frequently see. This tends to be sleep maintenance insomnia, which is, as anybody who's run, you know, as sees patients in sleep clinic knows, that is the most painful to treat, right? It's very, very difficult to deal with the sleep maintenance insomnia patients. Um, restless legs, excessive daytime sleepiness, despite everything we try to do to sort out a, a high percentage of Parkinson's patients still report this as a terrible side effect for them or a terrible symptom for them. Sleep Narco narcoleptic-like sleep attacks are actually surprisingly common in these patients. Um, and there's sort of maybe an increase in sleep disordered breathing, although a couple of papers have come out a little bit more recently arguing that this probably isn't actually accurate, um, that their risk isn't actually higher. Um, so this gets to the point I was making. So we see very commonly a Parkinson's patient will come in and they'll say, I have insomnia. And I'll say, well, what do you mean by that? What, what time do you go to bed? And they'll say, well, um, you know, a lot of times our wife will say, you know, eight different times a day, right? They'll fall asleep on the couch in the afternoon, and then they'll fall asleep in the easy chair after dinner, and then they'll go to bed at, you know, 10 o'clock, and, and they'll fall asleep, drop of a hat, right? But the problem is, is that one o'clock in the morning, they wake up, and they're up from one to two or three, and then they're, you know, they basically describe this phenomena of I sleep sort of off and on for the rest of the night, and then I sort of drag out of bed at, you know, seven or eight in the morning feeling unrefreshed. And that's incredibly common in Parkinson's patients, and it's very hard to deal with. Um, and, you know, some of them, they were, you know, some of these are kind of easier to deal with, meaning, well, you know, their neurologist is treating their movement problems during the day and they're getting all this Cinemet or dopamine replacement during the day, but then, you know, their last dose of medicine is at 6 p.m. and then their next one is at 7 a.m. the next day. So, you know, their medicines wear off, they get stiff, they get rigid, they get uncomfortable, so they can't stay asleep. So, you know, easy things like throwing some extra long-acting Cinemet at those patients is hugely helpful. Um, if we're that lucky, then that's great. Um, a large percentage have uh, untreated restless leg symptoms. Um, 
And those are easily treated by the, the same mechanism. And sometimes those are worse because they sort of have a rebound effect after they've worn off of their sentiment. And as you guys know, the sort of shorter acting dopaminergic medicines can often make that worse. Um, a lot of times they have terrible sleep hygiene and this phenomena of, you know, they get up, they, you know, drag out of bed at eight, they eat breakfast and then they fall back asleep for a little while and then they'll, you know, go have lunch and then they'll fall back asleep for a while and then they'll, you know, go for a walk and they'll fall back asleep for a while. And, you know, as the disease progresses and they're closer and closer to an institutionalized setting or assisted living facility, um, nobody wants to sort of play with them during the day. And so they get stuck in front of a TV, right, where they're just going to nod off watching Oprah or something like that during the day. So it's really important to try to work on that. Um, sometimes they do have bladder or prostate problems. This is something that I'm amazed at how infrequently this gets asked, right? A patient comes in, they have terrible urgency or frequency from their Parkinson's disease, right, which causes an overactive bladder, sort of neurogenic bladder type phenomena. And they've all been put on Flomax and uh, medicines for their prostate, and they're, oh yeah, my prostate's fine. And it never went further than that. So giving them some anti-muscarinic or sort of, you know, ditropan, detrol, um, or the newer drugs at bedtime can be hugely helpful for that. Um, and then dealing with the circadian problems, right? They, they do have neurodegeneration in, in parts of the brain um, that are responsible for the circadian rhythm. So doing the things that we would typically do, giving them melatonin, bright light therapy, um, enhancing their zygerbers, getting them to exercise during the day, um, all make a big difference for that. So, like I said, they're twice as likely to have early morning awakenings. Most report at least two to five awakenings per night. Um, and this gets worse and worse over the, the course of the disease. So what do we do for this? Like I said, tuning up their medications is the easiest thing. Taking away medications during the day, which can sedate them, right? As most of you guys know, um, dopamine agonists used at higher doses can be incredibly sedating. Um, so what you, what you gain in motor function for treating these patients, you often lose in terms of, you know, well, I, they could tap their fingers and stomp their feet faster after taking their Miropex, but they're dozing off on the couch anyway, so who cares? Um, and so tuning those kind of things up helps. Um, there's really very little data in patients once you've tuned up sort of the obvious stuff as to what helps. And, you know, sometimes Ambien be, can be kind of helpful, but then you can get into problems. They, if they do have parasomnia stuff, they're often more disabled motorically in the night, so they're higher risk for falls and all kinds of other problems. Um, obviously, there's a black box warning associated with Seroquel or Ketiapine that we have to talk about when we use that for these patients. Um, one of the things that's been interesting is subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation. Does everybody know what that is? Probably not. Um, so deep brain stimulation is a, a surgical therapy for Parkinson's disease where we implant electrodes deep into the brain. Um, and it provides stimulation and sort of treatment continuously through the day and night. And that's actually shown to actually improve sleep dramatically. And lar largely that's because you're treating their symptoms or their motoric symptoms through a 24-hour cycle. So that actually makes a difference. Um, Bill Ondo did a study using Xyrem um, 2008, which is kind of amusing because I saw him on a plane one time and asked him how much he actually uses that in real life um, outside of studies, and the answer is kind of not much. Um, just because it's so hard to, to get and get it approved and deal with the central pharmacy, and you've got relatively you know, disabled patients, so it's not easy. Although they did show a sort of remarkable benefit. Um, and then, you know, I'll use a lot of clonazepam at super low doses because I'm often treating the REM sleep behavior disorder anyway. So in non-demented Parkinson's patients, that can be very helpful. You just have to be careful about falls, confusion, and all that sort of stuff. Um, otherwise, melatonin can be sometimes helpful for the hypnotic effect. Um, but I do find that really sort of a multifaceted approach of making sure they get bright light therapy, particularly here in Alaska in the morning, make sure they get melatonin at night, and really making sure they're active and exercising during the day and not dozing off is, is way helpful. So here's a video that was, um, I usually say stolen from Carlos Schenk, but not really. Um, I actually paid for the rights to use this. It's a thing. But um, oh. anyway, so th this guy is, you, know, you have to take my word for it, but this guy's in REM sleep. Um, So a lot of times, if you if you you know if you're this guy's bed partner, obviously you probably don't want to be so so for much longer. But um, you know if you just leave him there and he doesn't wake up, no idea this ever happened. Uh, he may wake up in the morning, like ah, oh, why is my hand bruised? Um, that kind of stuff. But and it doesn't actually decrease his quality of sleep either. Um, 
But the problem happens when you intervene, and you're, and this actually happened to sort of one of my very high function patients in, in California. Um, you know, the wife went to grab the husband, and you know, now she becomes the thing that he's dreaming about, and he broke her hand. And it just, you know, you basically, I basically tell people, you know, get away, throw a pillow at them, scream at them, that kind of stuff. But it can be pretty, pretty bad. Um, so I'll show you another. So this guy, if you wake him up, I mean, that's one of the interesting things too. If you wake these patients up in the night, um, you know, this guy was dreaming that he's a samurai warrior. This is a Japanese video, but, um, so, you know, people will shovel that. snow in their dreams. They'll do all kinds of stuff. And they're very, they're very purposeful things. Um, I had a patient up here very recently tell me that he was like dreaming that he was in the hospital. And, you know, it was like some, like an episode of Scrubs or something. But basically like one of the orderlies was like running down the hall with him in the gurney. And they pushed him out the front door of the hospital into the street and he jumped off the gurney before he got in the street and he literally just flew out of bed um, and hit when he you know, woke up and hit the floor. Um, so these things could be actually very dangerous. Um, you know, it, it is seen in right now, but um, you can't injure yourself, you can't injure your family members pretty dramatically if you're not careful. Um, and but they're really important for, for a number of reasons. This this to me is far and far and away. If you're a primary care doc and you're trying to sort out a diagnosis, um, this is like you can hang your hat on this. So if people have REM sleep behavior disorder and they have dementia, you know I I will bet my house that it's not Alzheimer's disease and that it is is uh, dementia with Lewy bodies. And so those are things that can be really helpful in kind of guiding you down a diagnostic pathway because it's incredible incredibly rare in Alzheimer's disease and incredibly common in this nucleon based disorders, Parkinson's, multiple systems atrophy, and dementia with Lewy body. So this this sort of asking the history of, you know, does he scream out at night or your, does your bed partner scream out at night? And, you know, do they ever punch, kick, that kind of stuff, fight tigers in their dreams can be incredibly helpful. When you're talking with the VA population, it can get a little bit messy because you do have patients that have PTSD and, and those issues can be a little bit harder to sort out. But for the most part, um, it's an incredibly useful sort of diagnostic piece of information. And it really does, you know, very strongly correlate with the alpha nucleon based disorders and not the tau-based disorders, although it can rarely be seen. So um, basically what, what happens here, right? And so what I basically tell, tell patients is that, um, you know, it, it, in Parkinson's disease, right, it's not just a disorder of dopaminergic neurons, as we were always taught, right? Everybody sort of thought, oh, it's the substantia nigra, you lose the dopaminergic neurons, so you get a tremor, you get rigidity, you get slowness of movement, postural instability. But really, Parkinson's disease affects the entire nervous system from basically the autonomic plexi around the gut, which is why so many of them have constipation problems around the bladder, um, and then all the way up through the brainstem. So this, this precedes Parkinson's in a, in a very large number of cases, and that number keeps growing as these, these cohorts um, sort of last for longer and longer. And this, this tends to, the pathology is basically in the subcerucleus nucleus of the pons, um, which doesn't mean anything to most people, but um, basically what happens is alpha synuclein gets deposited there, and when the pathway where your motor signals are supposed to be shut off during REM sleep, um, so that you can dream about fighting tigers without, you know, actually jumping out of bed. That basically gets gummed up by sort of alpha synuclein deposition, the dysfunction of those cells, and all of a sudden they're acting out dreams. And that tends to um, precede the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Um, and so this is where the locus subtrilius is. Nobody cares. So I'll go to the next slide. Um, and so. Um, yeah, so what are the implications of this? And I think this is the, this, to me, this is the fascinating part of this disorder. So there are tons of people in the, in the movement disorder and neurology world trying to figure out how do we slow down the progression of Parkinson's disease, right? Well, the first way is we all know that 70% of your dopaminergic neurons are gone by the time you ever develop your first thumb tremor or whatever it is that your first symptom is. And so, you know, as they say, sort of the horse left the barn already, right? And so the, the goal is you want to, figure out that this disease is coming on before you ever get to those um, obvious clinical symptoms. And so the ways of doing that, there's some, some groups at, in Pennsylvania at UPenn doing this, just doing something called the PAR study. There's a big uh, grant through Michael J. Fox looking at this too, um, looking at you know, smell identification because lack of smell um, is, a, is a very early symptom. 
you know, constipation, all these non-motor things that weigh perceived Parkinson's. But those are all very non-specific. They're kind of sensitive, but incredibly non-specific, right? You can, there's a million reasons you can have lack of smell. There's a, a million reasons why you'd be constipated, including opiates. Um, and so, whereas REM sleep behavior disorder, unless you, you know, have some reason, like you got into your second bottle of wine the night before, or potentially um, some medications can cause this, although more people are now thinking that SSRIs and SNRIs are really sort of like a challenge test for, for legitimate RBD, you know, this is a very specific finding. And, and the groups from Minnesota, from Barcelona, and their cohorts, if you have, you know, robust dream enactment behavior, there's a very strong likelihood, well over 50% now, that within 10 years you're going to get Parkinson's disease, dementia, Lewy bodies, um, or MSA, and so that that tells us, you know, if I start, dream, you know, having dream enactment, I'm going to start taking like T-type calcium channel blockers and, you know, exercising like crazy, doing everything I can to try to slow the progression of disease down. But those are the patients that we want to identify for neuroprotective trials, where if we have legitimate agents to try for neuroprotection, you can really enrich the population, because really our goal is if we can slow the progression down a little bit, then people are gonna die of a heart attack or something like that before the Parkinson's becomes a really big deal. So to me, that's the really exciting part of that, assuming that we get um, uh, decent neuroprotective agents to try, and so far everything has been a bust. So um, there are other groups, um, group up in Montreal has written a bunch about this, looking at different things that correlate with REM sleep behavior disorder, right? Parkinson's disease, we talked about syndromes yet the other day. So there's a lot of people that think Parkinson's disease is really a syndrome, right? There's a lot of different um, sort of phenotypes that Parkinson's patients can have, right? If you actually have a lot of tremor, you're kind of lucky if you have Parkinson's disease because it means your disease is probably going to progress a lot more slowly. You're going to have a lot less cognitive issues. Whereas if your first symptoms are you're stiff and rigid and your balance is bad um, and you really have sort of what's called um, postural instability and bradykinesia kind of form, then you're, you're going to progress more rapidly. You're more likely to have cognitive problems earlier on, that kind of stuff. And so REM sleep behavior disorder is thought to be a marker of some of the more aggressive forms of Parkinson's, although it's not totally clear that that's worked out. So what do we do about this? Um, in a non-demented patient, clonazepam is far and away the drug of choice in terms of the degree of efficacy. Um, really low doses, 0 0.5 milligrams can make a big difference, but we'll sometimes end up titrating up to two milligrams. Um, I have yet to have a Parkinson's patient have any sort of like abuse issues with clonazepam when used for this purpose. Um, a lot of people are advocating using melatonin as a first-line agent now because it basically has no side effects. Um, I remember when the first paper came out showing a 50% effect for this, I thought that's crap, basically, was my opinion. I've probably treated 200 patients with REM sleep behavior disorder and Parkinson's, and I can count on one hand the number who have responded to melatonin. But two more papers have since come out, and I guess you know maybe I'm not getting the dose right or I'm getting the wrong you know, my patients are going to the wrong drugstore to buy their melatonin, and there isn't really any melatonin in there or something. But there is data that melatonin does work, and so I keep on trying to use it, you know, as a first, first line thing because it doesn't have side effects, but it really hasn't been that clinically effective for me. So it is important to follow those patients back up because before they do break their wife's hand, you want to make sure you've captured their symptoms. Um, Seroquel is actually very helpful um, in these patients, even though it's listed more as a third line agent or second or third line agent, basically because it crushes the amount of REM sleep that you have, I think, is really how it's working. Um, but it does seem to be really helpful, even at those sort of like 12.5 or 25 milligram doses. Um, dopaminergic meds are just shifting, I think, your REM sleep around, which is why they may work. I'm not really sure that I believe that they're helpful. And environmental modification makes a huge difference, right? You don't want to have a thousand dollar vase next to your bedside table if you're, you know, if you're doing this. And you, you know, you you want to build a pillow pillow fort between you and your wife so you don't whack her on the head in the middle of the night if you think you're fighting Mike Tyson. Um, and you know, a lot of times I'll tell patients, you know, put your bed on, put your mattress on the floor so you don't jump out of bed. Um, and a lot of a lot of patients will go to separate beds. And it is harder. I mean, my general rule of thumb is in a non-demented Parkinson's patient. I'm going to go with melatonin and then clonazepam. Um, and in a demented patient, I'm going to go with melatonin and then Seroquel, because um, you really can't use the, the clonazepam in a demented patient. So daytime sleepiness is, you know, it's interesting. When you look at quality of life scores for Parkinson's patients, you know, we're obsessed because we're so used to doing clinical trials with how fast people tap their fingers, stomp their feet, all of this sort of stuff. But 
a lot of times, once a patient's had Parkinson's for seven years, the majority of their quality of life decrement is due to all of these non-motor features, their cognitive issues, their depression issues, their bladder issues, their constipation issues, and sleep, right? And the, the funny part to me is I'll see patients who have seen even good neurologists never ask about half those things, right? And so those are really important that we make sure we, we pursue. So with fatigue, obviously when we want to exclude medications, tune those up as best we can. We want to make sure we do good sleep hygiene you know, take care of all the low-hanging fruit first, but about um, a pretty good percentage of patients, even once you take, get rid of all of those things, just because of the disease themselves, um, still have sort of some over, overwhelming daytime fatigue to deal with, which is, which is really hard. Um, and some of them still have sleep attacks. And in fact, um, I wish I remembered the details of the study a little bit better, but basically somebody took a bunch of Parkinson's patients and just MSLT'd them all, and about 41% of them um, just went dropped, you know, were sort of hit narcolepsy criteria by having at least two so rims. So it's kind of dramatic how quickly these patients can sleep. So this is important <clears throat> both for us to know, but also when we're, we're thinking about, you know, driving in these patients, because that's something where that and the cognitive piece can really make a big, big difference. So, um, so how do we treat them? Obviously, we take care of all the low-hanging fruit. I'm still waiting to find that hypothyroid patient that I can tune up their thyroid, and then they're not sleepy anymore. But um, it's kind of a long way off, I think. Um, and then uh, making sure you've dealt with depression. I think this is coming up with the Robin Williams, you know, passing away recently. You know, it sort of highlighted that obviously he had pre-existing depression, but this is depression is a huge problem in Parkinson's patients. Fifty to sixty percent of them have it. There's a huge amount of apathy, a huge amount of daytime sleepiness, and we need to aggressively treat that. So, and obviously that can make you feel sleepy. Um, so, I do use some modafinil, um, and I find it's kind of helpful. Um, and it's funny, I think there are about three studies about this, one showing it was helpful, one showing it wasn't helpful, and one showing that it's sometimes helpful. So sometimes it's helpful, um, sometimes it's not. Um, and I do find in the ones that are more likely to have kind of those sleep attack kind of things, it tends to be more helpful in those as opposed to the like kind of apathy, like ah, I'm kind of tired, the kind of stuck on the couch but not actually falling asleep kind of tired. Um, so sleepy as opposed to fatigue kind of thing. Um, and then I do everything I can tuning up their medications, getting rid of sedating medications as much as possible. So moving on, Lewy body disease. Basically, all the same sleep problems you have in Parkinson's disease, you have with Lewy body dementia, but they're harder to treat because you don't have so many medications at your disposal because they're demented. Um, and you will worsen confusion, hallucinations, sundowning, all of those sorts of things. So they, because they're also an alpha nucleopathy, definitely have REM sleep behavior disorder, but you often will use melatonin. Um, environmental modification and sometimes low doses of Seroquel, particularly in the evening. I always make sure that I have that sort of increased risk of sudden death in the night with, for unexplained reason, black box warning discussion before I start patients on Seroquel. Um, I've thought about getting a sort of a little consent form to sign, the same way I've thought about that for using Ambien in all my patients, just because it's a risk that I want to make sure we've documented that we've had that discussion. Um, they, they do tend to have a lot more sort of irregular sleep-wake rhythm. Um, and it is largely because they're, they're demented. They tend to be more institutionalized. And as you guys all know, um, you know, it's, I feel like nursing homes are kind of like, in some ways, they're the opposite of Vegas. But in some ways, they're the same as Vegas, meaning they do everything they can to take away all environmental cues from you. So these patients are sort of like stuck in front of a TV sometimes with no sort of real sense of what's going on in the world, no night, no midday, that kind of stuff. They just kind of wheel to the lunchroom. And so really having, you know, and there's, there's actually studies showing like bright light therapy alone, not helpful. Exercise alone, not helpful. Melatonin alone, not helpful. Do all three together, helpful. So really pushing those things in combination can make a difference with those patients. Parkinson's disease with dementia, basically the same thing. Um, you know, and, and this is one of the things just to back up because I'm not talking to a neurology audience. Um, you know, patients will often ask, what's the difference between all these things? And maybe some people are thinking that out there right now. You know, Parkinson's disease is an alpha synuclein based disorder. In that disorder, motor symptoms precede cognitive symptoms, right? And by definition, uh, in Lewy body disease, cognitive symptoms precede motor symptoms, right? So Lewy body patients um, start with dementia and then they develop Parkinsonism. Parkinson's disease patients start with Parkinsonism 
and often can develop dementia, but don't always. And so it's kind of a continuum. And in fact, if you have a patient who has Parkinson's disease, motor symptoms for years and years and years, then develops cognitive decline, you know, 20 years later, if you look at their, their brain under a microscope against a patient who had the opposite, idiopathic Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia, and then developed motor symptoms later, brain looks the same under the microscope. So um, they really are a continuum, and it's sort of this artificial distinction of sort of, well, if the dementia came first, it's Lewy body disease. If the motor symptoms came first, it's Parkinson's. But really, they're all very similar. Um, so I'm going to change gears and talk about a different alpha-synuclein disorder. Um, and I'm going to give you sort of two cases here, two different ways this presents. So this is a patient that I saw back at UCSF who was originally seen by a guy named uh, Bob Laser. Um, he's a phenomenal neurologist. Um, and this, this patient was actually a primary care doc out in Fresno who came in complaining of heat intolerance. I feel like this kind of loud. Um, episodes of sweating, occasional slurring of speech, subjective sort of the kind of general, hey doc, like I don't feel so steady on my feet even though my exam kind of looks normal. Um, and Dr. Laser didn't really have a great explanation for him, so he did what we often do in neurology land, which is, you know, throw them back into the ocean for a little while and pull the fish back out six months later and see what, see what time has showed us, basically, because a lot of these disease progress and we find out, well, it either gets better or there are more symptoms that can help us make a good diagnosis. And so that's what happened here. We got sent over to see a movement disorder neurologist. And the patient had some bradykinesia, um, some sleep disturbances, these periods of sort of insomnia, alternating with prolonged sleep, a lot of urinary urgency, sort of jerky, irregular tremor, um, some creepy snoring is how the wife described it to me, and then had some hypometric saccades, so meaning the eye movements weren't totally clean. They didn't get all the way over to the object they were trying to follow. Um, there was no, no clear at clear evidence of rigidity on the examination, but there were sort of slowed, rapid alternating movements, which we typically see in Parkinson's, and a little bit of unsteady gait um, with a positive pull test, which you don't usually see that in Parkinson's disease. So one of the things that we'll do is we have you know patients stand with their feet shoulder width apart, and we stand behind them, and we say, we're going to tug your shoulders. I want you to keep your balance. If you need to take a step backwards, fine, because our goal is to see that you have the postural reflexes. And so if a patient you know, falls over into your hands, you know, doing that in the first couple years of Parkinson's disease, that's a problem. It's very uncommon that that's the case. And so it's a kind of a tip off that maybe there's something else or an atypical Parkinson's syndrome going on there. Um, so that was kind of unusual. So I asked his wife to record his creepy snoring with his eye, with her iPhone. Our floor was full a couple weeks ago. So they put her um, in my block on uh, three north and um, she was fully dressed patient, I'm sure of it. And it was, you know, also post Higa. She had the gastric. I would need that whole bariatric. Okay. So, do you guys get a reasonable sense of that? So, I'll often imitate that sound for patients because they, you know, they can't really describe what it is, but it's on inspiration, which is kind of a key issue. Um, so, this is a video, kind of a similar situation for a guy that I saw who we ultimately, with Mark Corey, who's sort of the ENT voice center guy at UCSF, we recommended a trach, and while he was deciding whether he wanted a trach or not, he actually passed away. Um, so, here's this guy. Go ahead and read. Please state your name and today's date. Let me do the date. Please just go ahead and read. Please read, read. Please read the following paragraph aloud. The rainbow is a division of white light into many beautiful colors. These take the shape of long round arch with that path high above and its two ends apparently beyond the horizon. Please perform the following task. Hold out the vowel E for three to four seconds at a comfortable speaking pitch. So, so that guy actually had no clinical symptoms other than that, um, which was sort of interesting. Um, so let me do this. So that's sort of one potential presentation that, that we want to look for. And those are similar phenomena. I'll explain a little bit more about it later. But um, this is a, a different presentation of, of what I consider to be the same disease. And so this was a patient I actually saw when I was a fellow at Mayo. And um, I, I, I didn't know what was going on. It's one of those things where I presented to my attending. And I was like, oh, oh. Um, so this was a 54-year-old woman who was, uh, she's pretty overweight, um, and she was vacationing in Canada with her husband, and he woke up and went to go to the bathroom, and then he came back, and she was, like, unconscious in bed. So he called EMS. 
he was doing CPR until they got there. Um, she got intubated at Wawa Hospital, wherever that is, I have no idea. Um, and then was transferred to Salt St. Marie Hospital um, and underwent sort of cardiac and pulmonary workup. And nobody really had an explanation for what was going on. Um, so she was kind of discharged and uh, did sort of poorly, kind of recovering from her hospitalization. And five months later, this happened again. She was hanging out in a recliner. Her husband walks in and she's blue, um, calls EMS, goes to Michigan State Hospital. I realize there's some lacking information on this blood gas here. But anyway, long story short, she was profoundly hypercarbic. Um, they had trouble weaning her and they ended up traching her. Um, and they said, well, she's got central hypoventilation. We don't really know why. Um, so she went to this thriving metropolitan area of Rochester, Minnesota, um, and which is a, gr a great place to train, but um, not much to do there other than train. Um, so basically she had an evaluation by pulmonary. He sort of said, well, we don't think this is a neuromuscular disorder. Um, let's go ahead and treat. There were some components of her um, on her PFTs suggesting an obstructive picture, and they said, well, let's treat that with inhalers and stuff. Um, internal medicine said, ah, maybe this is a mucus plug. Um, and so it wasn't really clear what was going on. So she saw neurology, um, and she sort of described being kind of klutzy for a couple of years and having sort of an overall sense of sort of weakness slash fatigue. Um, felt that her left lower extremity kind of dragged at times. And her husband described striderous breathing um, at night that actually predated all these respiratory arrests. Um, she had difficulty getting out of a chair on exam without sort of pushing off with her hands. She was mildly unsteady with, like I said, the sort of left lower extremity. Uh, stiffness and, and rigidity. She had a reduced arm swing on the left side, slowed rapid alternating movement. So these are all elements of Parkinsonism that we found on the examination. So uh, it was recommended she, she give a trial of Cinemet, um, which later that week she came back, actually had a, a pretty good subjective response to Cinemet, um, but not, not dramatic. Um, further exam on that visit showed she had you know pretty low blood pressure, but was also orthostatic, um, continued gait imbalance, had a Babinski sign on the left, um, and the same sort of slow draft alternative movements and stuff, Parkinsonism on the left side. So part of our workup we sent her, and this is something I profoundly miss being able to do, we, we sent her to the sweat box, um, which is this kind of ridiculous test where, um, I think they do this at Wisconsin, Stanford has one now, I'm not sure where else they have it, but Mayo has it, and you basically, um, you, you paint somebody in this iodinated compound, um, you paint them purple, and you stick them in a giant human oven and put a video camera on them. And you just watch where they sweat. And when this compound you know, gets wet, it changes colors to yellow, right? So you can get a very clear picture of where people have sort of a uh, decrease in sweat, right? So that's a measure of sympathetic activity. And it's interesting, if you look here, um, there's preserved, preserved sweating in the feet here and in the hands, right? So this is the opposite of what you would see in like a diabetic neuropathy, right? A di diabetic neuropathy is sort of that ascending neuropathy. So if you sent, you know, a regular garden variety diabetic patient to the oven, um, then they would look the sort of the inverse color of this person. So this you actually very rarely see with anything other than multiple systems atrophy or pure autonomic failure, which is kind of a similar disorder actually. Um, and so it can be a very useful test. Um, to sort of evaluate this. So um, we ended up diagnosing her with MSA, and that was the diagnosis these other patients ended up getting. Um, that gentleman, I think, actually underwent autopsy, which was very useful, um, the guy that died before trach. Um, but so this is, this is, you know, you don't see this disorder very much, um, but it's really important to spot because people will die on you very, very quickly, or they can die on you very quickly. And so we actually, um, it's, it's sort of been all downhill since there, then, but um, in terms of my academic career. But basically, in that situation, I, I saw that patient. It was like this classic, like, this is what medicine should be like. So I saw that patient. I asked my mentor, this is so interesting. How often do you see this? And he's like, I think I've seen this a couple of times. So we did this, like, quick, you know, low risk IRB, got the records because Mayo has this crazy sort of basically database system. And literally, like, so within 36 hours, I had submitted um, a three case series to Archives of Neurology, and I literally submitted it, and then I went to see a patient, and then I came back, and it was accepted. So the the um, uh, the editor 
basically evaluated it himself and just accepted it as a case series. And I, that's never happened to me ever, ever again. I've written way more important papers than that or marginally more important papers, and they were all way more difficult to get through. So I thought that's how it was, and I was like, this is awesome. Um, but anyway, so, uh, <laughs> this is, so it, it's not that easy. Um, but basically, MSA patients can have tons of uh, basically sleep disorder breathing related problems that we need to watch out for. And a lot of times they will present to ENT or they'll present to pulmonary before they present to a neurologist. So they really need to have a high index of suspicion. And they really need to ask about stuff like REM sleep behavior disorder because that can really help. So basically, Strider is pretty uncommon, so there are some things that you know ENT docs see that can that can cause Strider. But in an otherwise normal patient that has no like recurrent laryngeal nerve problems or whatever, Strider is unusual to have that sort of quote unquote creepy inhalational snoring. Um, and if they have that, that's something to look at. So these patients can have abnormal uh, respiratory rhythm, and I've had a couple of patients' spouses actually point out they sort of have irregular breathing patterns that they'll sort of increase and decrease and randomly pause even when they're awake. It's kind of sort of odd. Um, and then they have impaired chemosensitivity. Let me see how I'm doing on time, just so I don't keep you guys from lunch. Um, so Mike Silber wrote a, he was a neurologist slash sleep doc over at Mayo Clinic, wrote a, a series in 2000. It sort of basically showed if patients do have Strider with MSA, um, it's a huge marker for their risk of dying soon. Um, and so if they do, you need to either deal with that, um, which at the time they were rec recommending trach, it's gone back and forth as to what people actually recommend for these patients now. Um, but to me, it prompts a very, very serious conversation about what the goals are for these patients. And the reality is, is that these patients are at very high risk of dying in their sleep if they have Strider. Um, the flip side is this is a very aggressive, sort of untreatable, basically, form of Parkinson's or Parkinson's syndrome that really, really stinks. So um, for some of these patients, you know, dying in your sleep is not the end of the world. Kind of, well, it is the end of the world, but it's, it's, you know, it's something where you have to have that conversation about what their goals really are. Because I have had patients, um, even with Strider, who I followed for years and years, and it's been brutal for their families and them. Um, and, you know, I think some of them wish, you know, some of them wish they would die in their sleep kind of thing. So it is something where um, it does prompt a very serious conversation about what their care goals are, and you make sure you have that in place and what they want to do. So this is kind of, you know, getting a little bit esoteric here, but basically, you know, normally your vocal cords are supposed to, um, you know, close when you're uh, not doing anything, and they sort of, uh, sort of get pulled taut when you're ex exhaling and then pulled open when you're inhaling. And uh, so when you're inhaling, it kind of looks like this. Your posterior cricolarytenoid muscles pull open, um, and if you have bilateral uh, paralysis, like if you have, I don't know why you have it, but bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve paralysis or something like that, um, they would look like this. Or if you have bilateral vocal cord dystonia, as is what happens in MSA, it can look like this when you're trying to inhale, which is why that guy who was reading that sentence, every time he had to inhale, just this big, because <sighs> he had to break through that. Um, and the same is true with uh, the striderous patients at night. Um, so it's interesting, you know, this was noted a long time ago. And in fact, um, for all of you guys who think that orthopedic surgeons are the only athletic doctors out there, Roger Bannister, who is the first guy to run a four minute mile, is actually a neurologist. Um, he may be the only athletic neurologist ever, but, um, <laughs> but so he actually described this and, and sort of counted uh, neurons in the nucleus and vagus and sort of decided that this was a sort of a, a, a loss of function of those neurons or a paralysis, and that's not actually what, what ends up being the case, but um, he gets props for trying, I guess, and for running a four minute mile. Um, but basically it ends up that it, it turns out that that's probably a dystonia or sort of involuntary muscle contraction uh, of those muscles in, in the night. Um, and uh, I think I sort of covered this already, but what it looks like is even if you do trach these patients, which for a while there was sort of the recommended way to go, they can still die in their sleep. And the reason is probably because of impaired chemosensitivity in these patients. So um, I feel like the front row may criticize me for not knowing as much as I should about this study, and they know a lot more about this than I do, but it was kind of interesting. So um, in 2002, they did a study basically where they had patients who were diagnosed by movement disorder specialists with multiple systems atrophy, 
Then they had these patients with what are called idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia, which is a diagnosis that doesn't really exist. It's basically like, we don't really know what's going on with this patient, let's wait and see, but it looks like they could have MSA. Um, and so basically, what they, what they found is that the MSA patients, when they put um, sort of a mask on them and, and sort of cut dropping the oxygen level, the MSA patients, their respiratory rate didn't really change, right? They didn't respond to that. Whereas there's a subset of these idiopathic late onset cerebellar ataxia patients where they increased their ventilatory drive and there were some that didn't, right? And so it turned out that the ones that didn't and almost all of them ended up getting diagnosed with multiple systems atrophy eventually. So the point being that this is sort of a marker of impaired chemosensitivity in this uh, population. So, and, and this actually localizes to the arcuate nucleus um, and the medulla. Um, I won't test you guys over that later. And what you can see is in Parkinson's patients, interestingly, there's a loss of neurons there, but Eduardo Benaroque did a study counting in MSA patients, and there's massive depletion of these neurons in MSA patients. So um, they have severe lack of chemosensitivity. Um, so it makes me a little nervous actually thinking about this, because a lot of these patients do have a lot of pain because a lot of them will develop like an anticholus and stuff like that. So given that this is the case, we probably shouldn't treat those guys with any opiates um, based on the last talk, because they're probably way, way, way more sensitive to that than the average person would be. So they also have abnormal respiratory patterns. And this was outlined earlier, the pre-Botzinger complex is sort of where your respiratory rhythmogenesis is based. And so, um, you know, it's actually been shown that uh, they have a, a massive reduction in uh, neuronal population there as well. So um, it's kind of a very interesting thing. But so for these patients, basically, you know, they do have a very aggressive form of Parkinsonism that responds a little bit up front to Cinemet, but it doesn't really much in the long run. They tend to lose balance early on. They have a lot of autonomic complaints, um, but they really have profound respiratory problems that can be the presenting symptom before any of these other things come to attention. So sort of the point is that they can have strider, which can kind of set the stage for things because they've obviously got an obstruction there, but they also have prof profound impaired chemosensitivity and respiratory rhythms, which can all kill them basically. So these are my token slides at the end. Um, so for the tau disorders, um, basically, Alzheimer's dementia patients don't have anything interesting going on with their sleep. Um, I'm just kidding, but um, so they do. About 25 to 50 percent of patients have sleep problems, and probably that that number is hugely skewed from when you go from mild cognitive impairment through later stages of dementia. But the reality is, is almost all of them are related to circadian rhythm problems, um, sort of sundowning kind of phenomena, and um, and this gets worse sort of as they go along. So you have sort of loss of the, the regular day cycle. So doing things like exercise during the day, bright light in the morning, and melatonin is sort of the treatment of choice if at all possible. And then trying to do things at night. A lot of times people will use medicines like Seroquel to try to help them with sleep during the night, even though Medicare doesn't like us to do that. Um, if you use it at very low doses, it's very effective. Um, and so that can be really helpful. Um, they do have dedifferentiation of their, their non-REM sleep, and they can reduce their REM quantity sort of at later stages. And these, generally speaking, for the PSG techs, um, these are the, 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 the EEGs that are just so painful to score because you really have like, super low amplitudes because the brain can be like a little peanut floating in a sea of CSF, so there's so much insulation between the skull and the... Um, and, and the brain that you just, it really gets hard and they have a lot of slowing in their EEG. So it makes it really hard to stage their sleep. So I don't envy you guys on, the, on those patients. Um, progressive supranuclear palsy, which is another sort of tau-based, sort of atypical Parkinson's syndrome. So um, you guys remember Dudley Moore? Anyone? So Dudley Moore had PSP. Everybody thought he was just sort of a drunk guy that fell down a lot, um, which may have also been sort of true apparently, but he did develop progressive supranuclear palsy later in life, which is sort of a very aggressive atypical Parkinsonism where people get loss of balance very early on within the first couple of years of disease onset, and they get a lack of uh, vertical eye movements. So they, they literally, you know, you have them follow your finger and they literally can't move their eyes up. Um, and so they can get a lot of hypersomnia. Um, they, they tend to basically, their pons just get annihilated with tau protein. And so they can get a lot of hypersomnia. They get a lot of insomnia. They can get REM sleep behavior disorder, but it's pretty uncommon. Um, 
And they, they tend to lose a lot of their REM sleep for, for whatever reason. So other things, vascular dementia, which is basically, you know, either uh, well-located strokes or I guess poorly located strokes or just a lot of little strokes over the years can, can arguably increase your OSA risk, although it's kind of small series, so it's not totally clear that that's true. Um, they can develop the same um, lack of sort of regular sleep-wake rhythm like Alzheimer's patients can. Frontotemporal dementia, um, sometimes they're phase advanced, meaning what I describe as sort of Matlock syndrome. So um, the way I remember advanced phase sleep phase syndrome is, you know, people go eat their, you know, it tends to be common in older folks. They go eat the early bird special. They watch Matlock at seven o'clock and then it's bedtime. And then they're up waiting for a tennis court when the sun comes up at four o'clock in the morning. Um, so they tend to, to shift sort of forward like that. Um, but, you know, it's not super common, and it's a disorder that you may or may not ever see kind of thing. And then uh, ALS dementia can also cause, um, you know, arguably OSA, but there's obviously a whole lot of other issues that we're trying to deal with in terms of hypo hypoventilation there. So that sort of trumps it anyway. So um, so that's my talk. Thank you guys very much. Um, this is our logo that I got like two days ago. Um, so <laughs> thank you guys. And then, sorry that was so much neurology, but any questions you guys have for me? Okay. Go eat. Yeah. Yeah, so... So it is, I mean, it's useful to, to, to know early on. Um, you do want to do something for them. The question is whether you need to trach them or whether you need to CPAP them, depending on how common that, that is. The concern is with the impaired hypo, uh, chemosensitivity, that if you do do some of the things that trigger their sort of apnea threshold and then you start inducing central apneas, that you can arguably kill them too. So you want to be a little bit careful about how you titrate them, how you ventilate them, whether you use a backup rate and that sort of stuff. Um, but one way or another, you do need to treat them. It's just a matter of whether that's CPAP or trach at that point. So, and it is prognostically problematic, obviously. Does that kind of answer the question? Okay, we'll see you back at one. Have a good lunch.